Empty skin. Tears are the silent language of grief. Voltaire. I decided to say goodbye to my mother before she was cremated. With my grandparents, uncles, sister, and brother, we made our way to the funeral home. When we arrived, I stared at the ground as if the answers to what in the heck had just happened could be revealed in the paisley designs of that ugly brown funeral home carpet. I was five months pregnant, but the queasiness I felt was as strong as early morning sickness. My heart pounded in my chest, and the tears that had been threatening to fall began in full torrents. I can't do this. Those stories that say dead people look peaceful? Lies. The woman lying in the ugly derisory gown looked nothing like my mom. The funeral home somehow forgot to dress her in the elegant clothing we had provided, an inexcusable hindsight. Mom looked unreal, as white as an apparition. Her plump face was a pale orb. The lids of her eyes, lashes, and lips were nearly identical to the pale gray color of her skin. Her milky gray visage and the near absence of wrinkles, smudges, or scars elucidated her young age. This isn't right. I rubbed my temples reflexively. Her perfectly straight, dark brown hair was typically pulled back from her face in a tight ponytail, but it wasn't now. She was empty skin. My uncle, Robbie, squeezed my hands encouragingly and then walked away. It was only me. I felt so alone. It felt like the other mom had one. She fought the disease for 48 years, but it finally conquered her through death, merely days before Valentine's Day. Sometimes I found it easier to hold on to fiction. It may not be as black and white as I remember, it's black on black. Mom remains a thrilling mystery to me. Her disease was an intangible and overpowering force that came between the two of us. Mom's suicide affected me in an arcane and profound way. I was a ball of raw nerve endings, and the thoughts of nothingness were a relief. I lived life like a zombie, taking care of Kira and trying to take care of myself as best I could. I ambled through my daily responsibilities, even though I didn't want to, with no energy for living. It's the thousands of trivial things I would never experience with mom again that hurt the most. I would never again have the real mom and the valuable, loving memories that came with her. She never forgot to send me a birthday card, but now my mailbox remains empty. We would never dance in the kitchen together again or hear her sing those crazy Bosco songs. No more Frank Pervert. No more trying to feebly teach her the latest and greatest dance moves. I could never take her out on her birthday and purposely order her one too many sakis ever again. I ached when I thought about her missing the birth of her second grandchild. My first labor coach was gone forever. Even seeing the aspen trees change and fall has lost its magic. Nothing looks quite as golden without her. Nothing was the same without her. Depression surrounded me like a hovering death. Mom lost the battle only in life. She firmly believed in heaven and Jesus Christ. She was still living, just not how we think. Suicide has an extremely broad base and has appalling momentum. In the fall of 2013, the World Health Organization estimated that global rates of suicide are up 60% since World War II. Why do doctors and counselors tell you to exercise when you can't get out of bed? All I wanted was two fingers of whiskey, and they're suggesting I take up jogging? Really, doctors? Think about it. Make that a craving for four fingers, although I'm not really a drinker. There was another new bright star in the sky besides Kirk, and it was dazzling. Children today are very mindful of death, far more than adults realize. Simba's father dies in The Lion King. A pet is put to sleep. A grandparent passes away. A man opens fire at a Batman movie or in a grade school. Above all of this worldly death, I had to tell Kira that her beloved grandmother was dead. How much can an innocent child take? Everyone really loves you, kid, but they still chose to kill themselves rather than to watch you grow up. That may not be what Kirk or Mom was thinking, but it was the truth regardless. But I never explained anything to my children in that manner. My innocent, untainted five-year-old daughter blamed herself, so we worked a lot on guilt. I urgently wanted Kira and my unborn daughter to feel safe in asking questions and sharing their feelings of sadness, anger, and guilt. 
Honestly and openly discussing painful separation, not denying it, would help her mental health. I didn't sit Kira down and say something like, Hey, Grandma killed herself but left you her jewelry. However, I did say, Grandma was sad, like Kirk was, and she took too many pills that caused her to die. I found that, in talking to my child generally, Kira asked as much as she wanted to know, and she stopped when she reached her limit. I vividly remember when all traces of Kirk's scent faded, first from the apartment and his pillow, then from his clothing. I feared losing Mom's scent too, so I tightly packed two of her shirts in large Ziploc freezer bags. I flattened the bag out, pushing and squeezing out excess air. I wanted so badly to preserve her smell.